The Gobi Desert sometimes seems endless. It's 240 miles or 400 kilometers from Jiuquan to Donghuang. And in many places you can see strange formations. Near Bulongji, it was especially strange. Winds of 90 miles per hour or 40 or 50 meters per second are not at all unusual here. Layers of sand 18 to 20 feet or 5 to 6 meters high can be seen for about 12 miles along the road here. Many peoples have fought for the possession of Dunhuang, and these strange formations remind one of ancient battles. Caves at Dunhuang, about 90 miles or 150 kilometers west of Bulongji, were rediscovered in a part of the desert that sheltered by a few trees. The British explorer Oral Stein, who came here early in the present century, said, I noticed it was still a vital place of worship, in spite of its greatly disrupted appearance. 75 years later, the Mogao Caves lay before us a carefully preserved treasure house of Buddhist culture. We first visited cave number 17, where Stein discovered an extraordinary number of precious historical objects a collection that amazed the academic world. Because of this, Dung Huang has been studied by scholars from all over the world. Mount Mingxia looms like a great wave over the landscape. The caves are in a mountain cliff, 150 feet or 50 meters high, and stretch a horizontal distance of about a mile or two kilometers from north to south. Here there are almost 500 caves, with about 3,000 statues and murals. If they were all lined up, they'd be about 30 miles or 45 kilometers in length the longest art gallery in the world. Reflecting the mouths of the caves, the Da Chuen River passes below, with the Sanwei Mountains on the opposite bank. There's an interesting tale about the origins of the Mogao Caves. A Buddhist monk by the name of La Zun came to Mingxia Mountain one day at sunset. He saw the peaks of the Sanwei Mountains opposite enveloped in glittering golden light as if a thousand Buddhas were manifesting themselves. Thinking that it must be a sacred place, he had the first cave cut in Mingxia Mountain. That was in the year 366 AD. It was the beginning of what was soon to be a treasure house of beautiful objects.
graves that can be visited today, the oldest is number 275, which was built in the 5th century AD. The main figure is one of the Buddha of the future, who sits cross-legged. It shows many features typical of ancient sculptures. For instance, the posture, the almost completely nude upper body, and the closely clinging robe are all typical of the old Western land style. robe over his arms even shows Greek influence. This mixed style is typical of the period. About the 5th century when this was made, northern China and also the area around Dunhuang were both ruled by the emperors of the northern Wei dynasty, which only lasted for about 150 years. This can be regarded as a typical relic of the northern Wei who were of a nomadic race, but who adopted the customs and manners of the more advanced Chinese. They also adopted Buddhism, but were eventually absorbed into the mass of Chinese who were in the majority. This Buddha of the future shared the fate of the people who created it. And this particular style is not found again in China, nor did it travel on eastwards to Japan. Cave number 285 was built about a hundred years later, during the Southern Wei period. The alcoves, which were designed for Zen Buddhist meditation, are in the same style as the Bihar caves in India. But if you look at the ceiling, you find it's covered with pictures of mythical Chinese heroes and animals. At the four corners lie guardian beasts, glaring out of the evil world. Here's a dragon with nine heads, a character in the stories of the Shanghai Sutta. Here's a legendary Chinese emperor, Hu Xi, and his empress Nuwa. The Indian world of Buddhism is surrounded with characters from Chinese stories. Cave number 428 was built in the middle of the 6th century, and it has a raised triangular ceiling in Chinese style. But the pillar in the middle of the cave is like those in the Tao Miao cave in India. This mixture of Indian and Chinese elements is typical of the early Dunhuang style. So, these early murals sometimes seem astonishingly modern in style. When they were first seen, many people thought they were like paintings by the Fauvists, ultra-modern, in spite of the fact that they are 1,300 years old.
But one solution to this mystery was found in cave number 263. Underneath a mural painted in the 11th century was another painting from about the same time as those in cave number 428. The figure was outlined with beautiful pink shading. So what looked like modern bold drawings are actually the result of the fading of the pigments caused by the light. The road continues through the Gobi Desert to Yu Menguan, about 60 miles or 100 kilometers northeast of Dunhuang. In the second century BC, the Han Emperor Wu Di had conquered the Western lands and Dunhuang became a place of great strategic importance on the Silk Road. Yu Menguan was a frontier area. Since those days, many other peoples have invaded this area, and many other Chinese dynasties have fought to retain it. A famous Chinese writer wrote a poem in which he said that when people had traveled 10,000 leagues westwards from Chang'an and finally reached Yu Mengguan, their hearts were torn with grief, for it seemed they'd reached the ends of the earth. Here's a part of the Great Wall that was built in Han days, still standing. Smoke signals were often used to announce the arrival of an enemy. These signals would be passed on from one signal tower to the next, until they finally reached Chang'an, about 1,200 miles or 2,000 kilometers away. The message would only take about half a day. In the later part of the 6th century, China was reunified under the Sui dynasty. The Sui dynasty was a very short one and only lasted just over 30 years. But in that time, Buddhism spread far and more than a hundred new caves were built at Dunhuang. The Sui cave builders seem to have been very fond of the triple image of the historical Buddha. The power and prestige of a dynasty that could reunite China and make converts to a new foreign religion is obvious in the lines of these statues. And you can also see evidence of contact with the Western lands in the clothing of the triple statues, and especially in the pearl string pattern.
the Sui dynasty was short, but it foreshadowed the glories of the great Tang dynasty that would come next. About 12 miles or 20 kilometers west of the Mogao Caves lie the ruins of Dung Huang Castle. Dung Huang was called Sha Zhou in those days and was filled with temples, with this castle at the center. It had a population of 16,000 and 1,000 of these were priests. The center of the modern city of Dung Huang lies about two miles or three kilometers east of the castle ruins. Today, this oasis town has a population of 35,000. In the autumn, it's always filled with carts on their way to the markets, carrying cotton, the main produce of this area. In the days when Dung Huang was a fort on the Silk Road, you could have seen people of many races with carts piled high with silk for sale. In the Morgao Caves, many scenes from the Silk Road are depicted. Here's one showing merchants who have encountered robbers on their way and who are trying to ransom their lives. The merchants are from Tibet and from other Western lands. Travel on the Silk Road certainly had its dangers. And when traveling across the wide desert, there were two absolute necessities, water and salt. There are many salt lakes near Dung Huang. Salt from these lakes must have been very useful for the travelers along the Silk Road. Even today, you can see people digging salt here. This oasis is called Yue Ya Chuen, and it lies in the foothills of Mingsha Mountain. Many worshippers used to pass through here on their way to the Mogao Caves. Stein, who came here in 1907, said that at that time, the Mogao Caves were still a place of living worship. On at least one day a year nowadays, you can still sense a similar atmosphere. On the Buddha's birthday, they hold an open-air market in front of the caves. And people come from nearby villages to celebrate with songs and to play the Chinese fiddle. This festival must be more than a thousand years old, dating from the time the caves were first built. Today, the spirits of the images seem to live again. The Tang Dynasty prospered partly because of the trade which came along the Silk Road. And it was during this time that the Mogao Caves went through a golden age.
The most popular Buddhist style of those days was a group of seven figures, with the historical Buddha in the center. He is flanked by Kasho and Aman, his most important disciples, and by four other figures, whose images express graphically the human emotions of pain, happiness, and peace. Cave number 45 is full of richly decorated figures, masterpieces of Tang art. This is Aman, who served the Buddha unceasingly. This is Kasho, symbolic of thought and the human will. And this is Tenno, who expelled evil spirits. For China, the Tang Dynasty was a great renaissance, and the great sculpture of this period was the inspiration for early Japanese Buddhist art. At cave number 130, the Dung Huang Cultural Research Center has recently begun new excavations. They found tiles decorated with designs of plants and flowers, which formed the original floor below the level of the ground. The enormous Buddhist temple, which they've revealed, is now being opened up to the world for the first time. If you stand on the excavated floor, about 10 feet or 3 meters below ground level, the caves appear far more lofty and impressive. The people of the Tang Dynasty saw a much more wonderful sight than anything we can see today. When we look up to the great Buddha of the future from this level, it gives us a powerful feeling of awe and majesty. The great Buddha is more than 70 feet or 26 meters high. During the Tang Dynasty, many people must have looked at this mural. Angels fly around the figure of the Amida Buddha, and below are many others in graceful poses. As the people sat listening to the chanting of the priests, it must have been easy to forget the cares of the real world for a moment. For this was the paradise of the pure land.
At that time, many people worshipped the Pure Land. About 200 of the murals at Dunhuang, or about a quarter of the total, are pictures of the Pure Land of the Western Paradise. This mural shows a sort of dance that was popular in Chang'an during the Tang Dynasty. It came to China from the Western lands and seems to have consisted of pirouetting on tiptoe to lively music. There are many contemporary poems about this dance. One of them goes something like this. The dancers spin like a whirlwind towards the sky. They seem to move as fast as lightning. Today, the dance is stilled, but its shadow has been preserved on the walls of a cave. When you think of Dunhuang, you automatically think of murals. And if you think of murals, you think of Dunhuang. Perhaps the most wonderful are those of angels. In the early paintings of angels, they're often in ungainly poses and their flying seems rather clumsy. and they seem to be soaring lightly in typically Chinese clouds, symbols of good luck. In this way, the idea of angels, which came originally from the far west, became typically Chinese. One of the staff of the Dunhuang Culture Research Institute had been looking all day at the murals of angels. And that night, he had a dream. He thought he saw thousands of angels with their long sleeves waving in the wind. When the last angel had flown away, he thought he heard an echo of the wind bells in the great temple and of the wooden bells about the necks of the camels. What kind of people were involved in creating the beauty of Dunhuang? At the northern end of the Morgao cave, there are small caves which have been opened up and they look like a beehive. After the communist liberation, 
unglazed plates and paints were discovered here, and there was even bedding in the cave. In order to paint a series of murals over a long period of time, the artists had to live in the caves. The place where the artists lived was only four meters square, and it had to contain such things as a bed, a table, and a brazier. Almost all of those artists were anonymous. There is one contract in existence dealing with an artist's debt, and the collateral he had offered was a child. He was obviously poor, and today we don't even know his name. Here are lead-based paints more than a thousand years old, but they still preserve their colors. This kind of paint, which doesn't fade easily, was used for most of the Dunhuang murals. But the names of the artists themselves have faded completely from history. This is a painting of the Tree of Life in cave number 57. The beauty of this painting of a bodhisattva is unusual even for the Morgao caves. The skin seems to blush with pale pink and the floral crown has been dusted with gold with the most marvelous skill. But some of the paintings are quite simple. Here, the donor has been painted with simple, bold strokes in a very realistic manner. She was a courtesan. The plaque says that she was donating six figures of the Buddha and that she was giving up her old ways to follow a religious life. In this tiny cave, only 10 feet square or 3 meters square, we see a slice of life from Dunhuang in its Tang heyday. The greatest enemy of the Morgao caves is the desert sand. The temples are attacked daily by this hand, especially when the strong spring winds blow in April and May. If they weren't protected, the temples would soon be buried under drifts of sand. Starting in 1963, four years were spent in serious restoration and the army built concrete walls to protect the caves from the sand. In order to keep a natural look, the walls were finished with sand from the desert.
Today, the beauty of the Mogao Caves is appreciated by art historians and art lovers from all over the world. But in the past, some people let their enthusiasm get the better of them and even vandalized the murals to take parts of them home. An American art historian left these holes when he took sections of the wall away with him. First, they painted the surface of the wall with strong glue. Then they pressed a cloth against the glue. When the cloth was pulled away, most of the painting came off with it. Then they put plaster of Paris on the back of the painting and transferred it to the plaster surface. But, as you can see, this process was far from perfect and some of the paint was left behind. Two of the bodhisattvas from this wall were taken away like this. Today, the pictures of the two bodhisattvas are in the Fogg Museum in Boston. Let's put them back and see what the entire painting looked like. The Tang dynasty brought a golden age to the Mogao caves. But eventually the dynasty collapsed. And this part of the country again became the scene of battles between various tribes. Some of the story can be read on the walls of Dun Huang. At the end of the 8th century, Dun Huang was ruled by a king from Tibet. In the middle of the 9th century, the chief of a local tribe, who was called Jiang Yi Chao, defeated the Tibetans and ruled the people. Here you can see him at a grand parade with his soldiers. see the king of He Tien wearing his famous Kunlun jewel. He came from an area to the south of the Taklamakan Desert, and his influence was felt as far as Dun Huang. This is King Shi Xie who ruled Dun Huang during the 11th century. During the reigns of these various kings, something happened that we can't explain today. The mystery of cave number 17. There are actually two mysteries connected with this cave. The first is why such a tiny cave, only 10 feet square, or three meters, should have been built near the entrance to the larger cave, which is today number 16. The key to this mystery can be found in this statue of a chief priest called Hong Bian. He helped Jiang Yi Chao regain the rule of Dong Huang from the Tibetans in the 9th century. The small cave was built in honor of Hong Bian. in the mural represent his companions. This then was the reason why this small cave was built.
But when it was discovered, it was full of an enormous number of documents and paintings that attracted the attention of the entire academic world. Why were they put into the cave and then sealed up? There are two theories about when the cave were sealed. One says that it was in 1036 AD when Shi Xie conquered Dunhuang. The other is that it was a little later in about 1054 during the actual reign of Shi Xie. The people who hold the second theory say that Shi Xie respected Buddhism, so there would have been no reason to hide the books and paintings before he conquered the country. But during his reign, many Muslims came from the West, and it's believed the things were hidden to protect them from the Muslim iconoclasts. Perhaps we shall never know, but this mural is at least witness to the fact that Dun Huang was an important point for cultural exchange on the Silk Road. For the beautiful woman under the tree was a goddess from the Western lands, a goddess of fruitfulness. In Persia, she was pictured as Anahita, who stood under the grapevines. East, the figure appears as the goddess Yakshi, who stands under a mango tree in Baput in central India. And at Tuofan, another important stopping place on the Silk Road, the goddess stands under a tamarisk tree and symbolizes the survival of life in the desert. Still further east, in Chang'an itself, we can see a beautiful woman under a tree painted on the tombs of members of the imperial family. And finally, still further east, we can see her again. This time on a screen preserved in Japan, in the famous Shoso In Imperial Treasure House. Even today, the Mogoa Caves can still reveal the story of how the Silk Road brought about this great cultural interchange. <laughs>